Take note of Will Daly, because he is the subject of this edition of the Music Is My Life podcast from Berkeley Online. I'm your host, Pat Healy, and on this episode, Will Daly takes us through a career of peaks and valleys in the most uncertain age of the music industry. Through leading a successful band to a solo career, begun by selling his car for studio time, now that's dedication. To a stint on CBS Records and a gig as Gary Sinise's band leader on an episode of CSI. To a jump to the Universal label that he walked away from, to his current crowdfunding campaign for his next release, which he is recording as he is raising the money. It all started for Will Daly at the age of 12. At least that's what I read on Wikipedia. I remember reading somewhere like age 12 you picked up a guitar or... Yeah, that bio is just floating out is there it? somewhere, it's, huh? It's Wikipedia, the danger of Wikipedia. Is Isn't it true? Well, this is your chance to write it, to right. correct everything. Um, I, I mean, music was always there. It wasn't like for 12 years of my life I was wandering. Um, it was always something that I pursued and was drawn to and felt, I would say, at home with mm -hmm. and comfortable in, like, now that I look back at what it's like to be a kid, and you have anxieties as a kid, and you don't even know it. And mm -hmm. like you see kids now, and uh, they probably even have more anxiety than I did at 12 with everything that's in the world and all the grown ups looking at machines in their hands. So, uh, music was always um, an island of, uh, away from any kind of anxiety, mm -hmm. any kind of worry, and probably a place to put that worry and put fun and put uh, things out. So it started pretty much with a tennis racket. Yeah. You know, and, and, and mimicking playing guitar and, and lip singing or singing along with my dad's records, my mom's records, then my stepfather's records, and then my stepmother's records, which added a huge amount of pluralism yeah. to my perception of what music could be for somebody. Yeah, because they all listened to different stuff. My mom yeah, listened to like Placido Domingo, Willie Nelson, she loved show tunes and would take me to to musicals um and she liked popular music and anything but uh um my stepmother listened to pop music and oldies mm -hmm. and my dad loved u2 the police zeppelin um you know joshua tree and octoon baby were a big deal to my dad mm -hmm. and um and then my stepfather loved james taylor hollow notes neil young um, I remember I met my stepbrother when I was six, and it was Van Halen. He was older. Yeah, he was, he's about seven, eight years older than me. Yeah, so, so it was just he was, he was giving you a guided tour. When I first met him, yeah. it was like a Van Halen poster. Yeah. And so Van Halen was huge when I was six yeah. to me. And then um, my mother, you know, was like, "Let's do piano lessons in kindergarten." That was cool. Mm -hmm. I went through piano lessons on like a toy piano at home, and yeah. and then I went to. Like, what were some of the songs you were asking your teacher to teach you? That, that, that was just the BS Mary Had a Little Lamb and stuff like that, oh, just okay, trying to get okay. through it. And um, and then I would just kind of drift into the the make-believe land of the half the lesson, half where I was just going to wander off. And that happened. I remember that happening with my toy piano at home and lessons like that. Yeah. And then I went to trumpet, violin. I liked the trumpet. I didn't get very far with it. Violin was scary and torturous. In my first, like you know, third grade recital with violin, I turned it upside down and just played the back because I was like, I don't know really? this shit. <laughs> yeah, and I'm not so gonna was, bullshit. I'm not gonna a, bullshit a or force my way through it. A solo, and you had the, no. It okay, was okay. it was you know it was, you were it part was of an ensemble. ensemble, and I just I wasn't gonna um, ruin everyone else's good time. Because that would have been a really avant-garde statement if it was solo and you just turned it over and did that. That would have been insane. <laughs> Um, so I guess when <laughs> when was the first time you really you know you put something into it and got something out of it? You know, even before I got a guitar, my yeah. stepfather, when my mom met my stepfather, was like eight, and he had an acoustic guitar. Mm -hmm. Prior to that, my father had a friend who had a music room in his house that was full of guitars, and I just remember going to any place where there's a piano and just wanting to sit at it and make noise, and. Um, 
my, my father's friend's guitar room, just going up there, and he would turn all the stuff on for me, and I would just make noise and, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't chase, like, I, I want to all of a sudden pick this up and be proficient at it. I kind of want to get in that magic space because all the music that I was influenced by and was introduced to and the music that I was discovering even, because I was, you know, Michael Jackson, the whole Michael Jackson thing, and it's like into grunge and everything. And then the records that my father's playing, I remember listening to Levy Breaks and just thinking, this sounds like magic. Mm -hmm. And I can still see the room, his living room at our at his house, our house, and the, the, the way the sun was coming in and the dust falling across the sunbeams and hearing Levy Breaks and thinking like, I know people made this, but there's something else at play here. Mm -hmm. And so I thought like, well, how do you get to the something else? So it was always those experiences. And, th and then of course, then there was a guitar in, a, in my house. After trying out all these instruments and really knowing my family thinking that I was gonna stick to anything at, at 12, I was like, I wanna get a guitar, my stepfather. Found one uh, that was used in Lawrence, Massachusetts. It was the kind, it must've been like one of those Sears ones that didn't have, a, didn't even have a name to it. Mm -hmm. Um, and it kind of looked like a jazz master, like an offset guitar. Do you still it, have it? Yeah, it's in my, it's, I think it's in my mom's basement. But I like try to take it apart and like yeah. do things with it so it's in pieces. Um, and I had to get 75 bucks together and we went and bought it. And I started taking lessons right away. And the, the t teacher was a Berkeley graduate. And I remember he came in to a 12 year old with some of those Berkeley books, mm -hmm. those first year Berkeley books. Yeah. And he, he did teach me right away. He brought the Berkeley books and taught me um, communication breakdown. Not because of Zeppelin, it's just like that was in his plan. Like he teaches yeah. every kid communication breakdown so he gives some rock and roll. Mm -hmm. And I would get the guitar magazines and I would learn ACDC all the way up to like Black Crows and Nirvana, Pearl Jam, all that stuff. And uh, show, show up to lessons with these other songs that I figured out and none of the stuff that he wanted me to. Yeah. How long I, did that last? That was probably two years. Oh, okay. So it wasn't like... Yeah. It was a productive thing. It wasn't it was, like he was just like, ah, oh, you're right. not doing this stuff. But I, I, I remember being bummed out by him or kind of anxious about the lessons or... And, uh, and just kind of confused by him. Like, wait, you play guitar? Isn't life great? You play guitar? Yeah. And he would get frustrated. And, you know... Frustrated is the wrong word, but I was anxious about he would be disappointed or frustrated, but, um, you know, at the same time, uh, I'm grateful years later that someone was, like, telling me what the Circle of Fists was, and I was right. like, I do not care about the Circle of Fists. Yeah. How do you get to the magic right. of the Levy Breaks? <laughs> um, so, but then I was just we're getting bands and bands upon bands upon bands and throughout high school. and, and Yeah, just, what, what was the first thing? Like, performance he did who when I got to high school because in middle school it wasn't cool to be playing guitar and mm -hmm. I was still playing sports and I couldn't I couldn't hit a baseball to save my life I loved baseball and I I didn't understand any other sports but I just had no hope there did people give you a hard time like you're tall you you can be totally. great at basketball yeah, yeah. or just or all my friends were just we would play wiffle ball and I love playing wiffle ball but yeah. I, I sucked at it yeah you can only endure that stuff for so long and I was having such a great time playing music. And then you get to high school, and then you find the other dozen kids who are just like you, who, yeah. who feel the same way about music. And uh, I found this one kid, his name was Ed Jurdy, and he's still my friend. And he still plays music too professionally. He's in a band called Band of Heathens. So I joined Ed's band, and there's, and there's a lot of like Credence, classic rock, uh, Black Crows, we would just like find classic rock tunes. We did like Born to be Wild and mm -hmm. Ed would sing. I I thought I was just a guitarist. I didn't feel confident in my voice. Plus when you when I was super young, vocalists were Robert Plant, Axl Rose. Right. <laughs> um A C D you know, it was just like there's no hope. Right. Um And what were some of the names of these bands you were playing in? Johnny on the Spot. Okay. Uh Red Tide. Yeah. Um, Boneyard. Nice, nice. Boneyard. That's that's the grunge. That was the yeah, grunge that explosion was one right there. Yeah. So I went to college and I met these guys and they were from Long Island and I played in a band with these guys forever. We called ourselves uh, Mapari. Okay. 
because we were a bunch of hippies at that point. Actually, our first apartment was in a basement, rat roach infested basement on Westland Ave, right down the street from Berkeley. Okay. And um, my drummer was going to Berkeley, I was going to UMass Boston. The other two guys weren't going to school. We all lived in one basement apartment. Across the street is the Christian, is Christian Science Church? Christian yeah. Science? And there's a museum in there, and there's that, a the globe. Yeah, yeah. So we walked in there, probably a little out of our skulls one yeah. day. And we're like, and you say something, and it just bounces around with sound. Right. We're like, sound never dies in here from a bunch of 18 year olds. Yeah. So, and were you playing kind of like hippie music? I would say so. It was like this is Frank Zappa. Mm -hmm. Post grunge, just four guys who were just throwing everything at the wall. I mean, it was just all—it was all over the place. Mm -hmm. It was fun, and I was writing songs. Again, probably kind of how I grew up with all this influence. The three guys in the band all had different perspectives, mm -hmm. and I was taking them in and trying to write songs, probably to please them. Yeah, in a way, and excite my exciting myself the whole time because I love the process of writing so much and I realized that around you know week two of having a guitar mm -hmm. but um, I was writing to uh, bring us all together and where would you guys gig? We started gigging I mean we first got here and we got a gig right away and had to like sneak friends in and then within a year we were headlining the paradise really yeah wow the first within a year I was in Rhode we were, Island at that time. Yeah, so we were all just like going to, um, we went to two different colleges, plus two guys worked in bars. Right, right. Or whatever, you know? Yeah. Restaurants or bars. So we had all this influence, and this is 98, uh -huh. something like that. So, I mean, we would spend our Monday night making posters, cutting them out. Friends would come over, they would design posters with us, then we'd all fill mugs with something and walk around Boston and hang up posters on stop signs and light posts and yeah. all the boxes and hand out flyers walking down the street. That's what you did. Right. And it shows you would get email addresses and then you send out postcards. Yep. But we lasted uh, one more year after that. Yeah. And then we broke up. I started a band called Liam, which is a lot more rock. Um, Any of the same guys or just? Same drummer. Yeah. And that was more like Jeff Buckley. Mm -hmm. Jeff Buckley just like cr and Nick Drake crashed in on my life. And this yeah. is 98, 99. That I mean, was I would say around like, the time that Nick Drake bubbled yeah, back up to the right. surface. Yeah, because all that Mopari stuff was like 96 to 98, and then 98 yeah. to 99 was Liam. And then Mopari got back together, but as a different band in 2000 that was pop rock, rock and roll, huh. harder rock. We would write pop rock songs. Interesting. Did you like revisit old material nope. or just nope, completely. Chuck it aside? Chucked it aside because a lot of that we never, there was nothing to put online. There was no history. Uh -huh. And I would say the first two shows we did, we had one quick reunion where we played that stuff, people were excited. But then within a month, we were back together, all new songs. The room filled up with old fans. They never came back. Right. And then we just built it back up right. to the Paradise again with brand new fans. That is and, a funny thing, though. It's like a lot of times when you're in that age group, you get everybody to come out. But yeah. then you find out that the people who were coming out to your shows aren't people who go out to shows anymore. Right. You know. Oh, totally. So. And and you find out some of them are your just your fan, friends and not your fans. Right. Right. Um, I guess that's kind of like the tricky thing is to first fill the room with friends, pretend that they're fans, and then get other people to latch on. You like have a limited time, kind of. You, you have know? a limit. Yeah. Um. um Anyway, so I'm still understanding that. I'm yeah. still I'm still going through. I mean, that's like, <laughs> there's 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 a way that never ends. I'm thinking even on a larger scale. You know, you have a single, it hits well. Yeah. Then a bunch of friends come out. Yeah. And then the single dies, and you find out who the fans are, and you got to keep them engaged. Right. So Liam's broken up. Liam broke up. We made a CD. We we did pretty well for a year or two, but it just. Uh, fizzled out my party. Oh, then I put out a Will Daly EP. Okay. After that, but then my party got back together because I didn't want to be Will Daly. Right. And those guys are still like my oldest friends. Yeah. Were you feeling the music every time in each incarnation? You know. Oh yeah. Because again, I was, I was chasing that. <clears throat> There's the guys in the band I was writing for. Right. While also writing for myself. 
but using their skills and their tastes to, I guess, inspire my own and, and, and expand my own and, mm-hmm. and add to that, again, not all the cohesion is word, but the pluralism of, of art and, and things that I've always struggled with because even now to this day, I don't fit into folk. I don't fit into total indie. Mm-hmm. I don't fit into Americana. I'm, I'm at, kind of at a place in my career now where it's coming around as a positive thing is now added up into. Yeah. Well, because you have enough material that... Right, now it's like the story's clear. Yeah, exactly. When and do you when do you finally... I'm just spinning my wheels more apart, but we got, a, you know, we're filming The Paradise again with a whole new audience. Yeah. Now we're in New York, we're meeting with RCA, we're meeting with all these people. Okay. This is, you know... And you're still believing in... The, it's not the hippie thing anymore as much no, as... No, it's not, rock. but I'm still not doing it just for me. Yeah. I'm still not doing my vision. Mm-hmm. I'm doing the collective vision and being democratic. Right. We might not say how I was democratic, but, you know, a lot of it was... Well, democracy does have a president, so. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> we got to work with a producer named Rob Stevens, who worked with Yoko Ono and Chili Peppers, and uh, that that helped, and that helped kind of strengthen my vision for myself. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, around year two of my party being back together and doing that thing, which is still youthful, still, like, we're still talking 20 to 23. Mm-hmm. And um, I just had all these songs that I was like, I'm not sharing these with these guys. And Mm -hmm. I was like, ah, this means something, A. Mm -hmm. B, let me just go do this for myself. And I found this studio in Austin, studio owner and recordist named Jack Younger, who's a really special and talented guy. And all his gear was vintage, built out in his apartment, looked like the Millennium Falcon in there. 16 track, one inch, no computers, mm-hmm. uh, no automation on the mix. So I go in and over the course of the year, I just start picking away at this record that would eventually be called Goodbye Red Bullet. Right. And I bring in the people I want to bring in, new people. You know, I had the bass player from a party play one song on it. Yeah. And I had the drummer play two or three. Yeah. Uh, and I had my best friend, who's still my best friend, the other singer, guitarist. He's now a teacher. He sang harmonies on like three or four songs and played guitar on one. But I made this record. It felt really special. It felt, it was the first thing I I was making that sounded cool. Mm -hmm. And at 03 it was, it was like this indie folk thing. Mm -hmm. It was like, it has all the indie stuff that I like. It has like the folk that I was influenced by from the seventies. And it has some Nick Drake-ness and it just sounds I guess like that magic for the first time because yeah. anything I'd ever recorded before then I was just like what the hell is going on uh-huh. and it had like a trashy you know uh, beginnerish thing to it right. too at the same time and and we're talking one inch tape <laughs> yeah and no I'd make it on the mix so we're mixing this thing and, and what are the guys in the band thinking are they like oh shoot Will is definitely leaving us or I mean I kept them somewhat in the dark and, and the other guys had like one of them had a hip hop band that's how diverse this band was and right. um, confused you know where other guys are in hip-hop bands um, one guy also played in a goth band <laughs> and then um, I was doing that yeah so we were you know we were pulling apart and it was really at the end of the day that band like a lot of bands was based on a lot of, of loyalty mm-hmm and I was super loyal to those guys, some often to a fault. Mm-hmm. And there was a guy that, you know, couldn't get his shit together at all. Right. Um, and then, meanwhile, these label deals for Mapari, are they going anywhere? Or so are, this are is... Are thinking they, they're going th- anywhere? This is or? right when, like, you see it all start to happen. Like, yeah. the guy, I remember the guy at RCA. And if we got in that office, when we got to go time, if it was a week earlier, we might have signed a paper. Yeah. Which would have sucked for me because right. I really like my life now. Right. Um, and how it turned out, and my music and how it turned out. Um, so that was a blessing. But a week later, the guy was fired from RCA. Oh, man. And then that just began a 10 year, almost 15, I mean, still going. Or, yeah. it, it seemed to stabilize the firing aspect and the shrinking. Mm-hmm. But. Um, Everyone just getting fired, shuffled, changing. Yeah. For the next ten years of my career, like yeah. I, right when the, the door opened up to the party. Yeah. Yeah. 
the booze is gone. <laughs> so you do Goodbye Red Bullet. It takes about two years. It takes about, yeah, it takes about a year. Okay. And then at the end, I was just out of money. Mm -hmm. And the studio owner was just like, well, I need a car. And we did this handshake deal. I gave him the car. Uh -huh. Oh, so it wasn't like you sold your car and used the profits. You just gave it to him. I gave it to him, <laughs> and he gave me a record. That's amazing. Yeah. That's it was, great. It was a fair trade. Yeah. And, uh, and then I quickly figured out how to get around. And, but I made the record, put it together. And this is 04, I put it out mm -hmm. and quietly let my party go away. I mean, we played The Paradise and then we played TT's. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I feel bad because I never sat down with everyone and said, like, we're done. I mean, me and my best friend knew it was done. Yeah. Um, the drummer had moved on to another band already in New York around the same time because we all just knew it. And, right. Um, the bass player, I remember him saying, is there any shows coming up? Because I was the one who always booked the shows. Yeah, yeah. I was like, no. Mm. And then, then I was did, putting up Did you do the up. Bowie thing? This is our last show ever. Nope. <laughs> no, no, you didn't do that no, from the stage? There was no last show. Yeah. But there was the last show. I probably knew it was the last show. Yeah. But um, how was my mind is putting this record out yeah and I and I was just gonna put it out and take it for a spin and have fun and a lot of friends were just like this is really cool and really special and some uh, fans of Mapari had heard it and were, were into it and so I put it out and had to kind of start from scratch and played Paradise Front Room yeah it's called and Paradise you're just Lounge playing solo right or did you no play I played together? with I got this drummer the, one of the drummers who played on Good Red by Red Bullet the bass player who played on it and my buddy, who was in my party, to play acoustic and sing the harmonies okay. with me. And we just did a CD release for it. But I remember I probably put it in 30 envelopes and shipped it off to, you know, naively to radio stations and stuff. But I sent one to XM Unsigned, mm -hmm. which isn't around anymore as a right. channel. But the guy at XM Unsigned named Billy Zero, who I still chat with to this day, heard Goodbye Bullet. And that added like five of the songs and did a special on the record. And so then my phone's ringing because labels still were still hunting for things. Right. And trying to discover things. Yeah. Now they don't discover things. They take things that are already doing well. Right. It's a whole different game. And, I, and I've gotten to the cool thing about my career in making music and it being my life is I kind of feel fortunate that I cut out my own hand flyers and hung them around town before I just post them on into Instagram now. Yeah. I feel fortunate that I got to like sit in an office at a record label. Yeah. And also sell my car and also now have my own thing that I've created and experience because it gave me a lot of information mm -hmm. and gratitude. Yeah. Right. You're not just operating from the new model. You n have knowledge of right. the old model and know what doesn't work. And, and some it. techniques from that that can, you can right. still apply. Right. Or perspective that you can still apply. So then they have phones ringing, and then there I am again, in the offices uh, in L.A. I was in, remember, the Capitol Records, New York, everything, lunches, so many nice lunches and dinners, and traveling around the country with Goodbye Red Bullet, booking my own shows, coffee houses, youth spots, clubs, jumping on dates with other songwriters. My friend lived in Seattle, so I'd go play Seattle, and she would drive me down to San Fran. Friend from San Fran would drive me down to L.A. I started playing in L.A. a lot. and uh, But the same thing was happening. People were getting fired left and right. Yeah. And I was um, living in Los Angeles in a friend's uh, office, like with five guys in a house, and yeah. what would be the office? I made a bedroom. Got real sick with appendicitis, had no health care. Oh, and, man. And at this point, I don't know, I'm 25. So, I was in LA, got super sick, went cedar cyanide, ruptured appendix, Ooh. appendix. It gets infected after. I, I'm like, I'm going home. I like, go home, go back to my parents, I, I think, for a while. Uh -huh. But I met this guy in LA who worked with a lot of warp Tour bands, and he heard a song, a couple songs of mine, loved them. And when I was out there, he was, I was showcasing for a lot of labels for him. And mm -hmm. we were, again, really, really close to a lot of different things. I would get sketched out a lot by some people, mm -hmm. so I would run from some things. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's funny so. you mentioned Warp Tour. I'm like, that does not seem like your no, no, sound it didn't. at all. <laughs> but he was, 
he was a really cool guy, and, and we worked together for a while, but when things got going and got cooking, he didn't know what to do with a songwriter that had a little bit of a marketing problem. Right. Because by then you got John Mayer and all these things, and then you also have Ryan Adams, and then you have like indie stuff, and you have Iron Wine. Right. And I was only a fan of a few of those things. Yeah. Plus I was a fan of like a lot of rock and roll, right. and classic rock, grunge still. And I was a fan of indie indie music a lot, right. and uh, Radiohead and all these things. So, well, it's that classic thing. I mean, I'm I'm sure you've been compared to a lot of people, and when you read the reviews, you're like, oh, I really don't like that guy's music. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> like, yeah. you know, just because you sound like somebody doesn't mean you aspire to sound like that person. Or because that's the vocabulary the person that's writing true. about you. Oh, so I'm back. I'm healing, trying to get out of debt. I remember I had this like. I had this guitar that I, I bought off a friend in high school who got me in my first band, who got me in the band uh, Red Tide. And uh, when we were seniors, he sold me his guitar right before he took his life. Oh, Jesus. So and it was a 70, 70 Strat. I was so broke, I had to sell that Strat. Oh. And, uh, and, and in a way, I thought maybe I needed to let go of it because I was also just so, it wasn't uh, working, so in a way, it's like a cathartic thing. At, at this point, are you starting to actually think of other careers? Yeah, no, I mean, I got a job from a friend uh, when I got back to Boston, <laughs> running an alderman's campaign in Somerville. Okay. Zero experience in right. doing that, but I also loved doing just weird things for the experience, and I loved, like, taking odd jobs to see how it helped my music, just the experience of doing different things with people. Right. And again, it goes back to that quest of pluralism and influence and how, you know, that input will then channel into my music. And uh, so it's kind of fun and kind of crazy and kind of just weird, but uh, a couple weeks back, that same manager in LA calls me. He's like, I got you an indie deal. And I remember I had said no to a couple of the deals in LA and we had, were close with a bunch of the big things and people were getting fired and shuffled around. And I just thought, this is horrible. And I, he's like, I, you gotta come back and I want you to work with this producer. And I just thought, no, I'm not coming back. And this was an indie uh, capital deal. Okay. So meaning someone who had a lot of money right. was gonna pay to make a record and they're gonna try to sell it. Right. And I remember the deal was like seventy-five or ninety thousand dollars, and I didn't, I didn't get anything. That really? was the budget that they had. Wow. To go get the next deal. Right, right. And I think they gave us like nine grand to make the record out of the budget. Oh man. And I was like, kind of uh, in the mode of I have nothing to lose. I'm just gonna okay. go make this record because, and it'll probably be the last one I do is Will. The only one I do is Will Daly. Right. And this one was. I've just been put through the ringer for the past two or three years, maybe seven. This is going to be my last record. Yeah. I said, I'm going to make it with this guy that I knew in Boston. His name is Tom Polche. I know he can make nine grand sound like 90. And I know if we can only afford nine days in the studio, we can get 10 songs done. Mm -hmm. And so we went and recorded uh, this record uh, called Back Flipping Forward. Mm -hmm. So we recorded it like just 15 hours a day. Mm -hmm. Recording I had such a blast. These songs that I had in my pocket for over the past two years just came to life. And Tom was able to add that for the first time for me, that producer element where this just went from a C to a A plus. Yeah. Right. So right right before we were about to record, like I remember being at the board in Q Division in Somerville and he says, My buddy is a guy I know in LA is revamping CBS records and wants to hear what you're doing. Right. And I thought, I've heard everybody and their dog. I've t I feel like I've met with everyone, I've been through everything, and I was like, oh yeah, sure, yeah, sure, whatever. Uh -huh. I just wanted to make something awesome Yeah. and get back to figuring out what the hell I was gonna do Yeah. with my life and how I was gonna cope with the fact that I might not be able to play music because I've been watching the business crumble around me. Lo and behold, we put out the record. It does really well in our independent release. You know, we sold 1,500 copies. But then CBS and then Rick Rubin heard it too. And so I'm meeting with American in LA. I'm flying out to LA and doing showcases again. And then uh, 
The guy at CBS, though, made an offer. It wasn't that fancy. It wasn't a lot of money. I think on that indie deal, for the, the investment indie deal, mm -hmm. I tricked them into buying me an acoustic guitar. Oh, nice. I said, well, you guys don't want me to play, and I don't have an acoustic guitar. I did, right. but it was not good, and it was super old, and I had it since high school. Yeah, so what did they buy you? I said, I what did you pick? I picked a, a Gibson Advanced Jumbo. Yeah. I picked a $2,000 acoustic guitar. Nice. And I felt like I had just changed the world. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I still have the guitar and I love it. Yeah. And um, it's actually, it was the kind, it was the one where they made it all spec like 1933, so it had the old lacquer on it. So it's all cracked now. It looks like it's really old now. Yeah. But then about six, eight months later, it's picked up by CBS and re released. And. I'm playing a show in LA. This guy, when I'm out back at the club, says, uh, "Great job, man! I'm, I'm going to put you on my TV show." The guy, tattoos, sleeved, and gold chains. I was like, "Who the heck is it?" Again, I'm right. still in that. We'll see about all this stuff, right? Right. right? You I mean, say yes see, to these things. And I you're say polite, yeah. But... I keep saying yes, and it's happening organically. Yeah. Right. And a lot of it, I'm just so pleased that I'm getting away with still writing songs. Mm -hmm. And I, that is the thing that just always made me happy. So with the CBS thing, I'm I'm just saying again, I'm saying yes to everything. Right. And maybe I should have learned to say no more. But I'd been through so many. Uh, I, you know, watching the business crumble around me, not knowing how, how am I going to finance the records I make, and I'm starting to get more and more of an understanding of what it's going to take to make the vision that I want. I understood that on Goodbye or Bullet, where we had I had strings and everything, mm -hmm. and, and back flipping forward where I had horns and pedal steel players and amazing harmony singers and stuff like that. I, I like people on my records. Yeah, I like human beings. Right, and I like the rub. Right, and um, and that's got to be the challenging thing about going by the Will Daly moniker. It's just like totally. And, and, as, and then all of a sudden I'm on CBS and, oh, that guy who came up to me at, at the club was the producer of CSI New York. Right. And he's putting, find me out to be on CSI New York with Gary Sinise. Yeah. And all these other things are happening. And then when we're in the van all the time, we're going all around the country. And then my brain starts to flip. And so I'm on the C I, I remember the night CSI aired, I had a panic attack. Yeah. I was like, I don't want to be on a TV show. I don't want to. I don't want people to know me for one song. Right. I completely, I wish someone was there to recognize it and be able to talk to me about it and manage me. Yeah. But I didn't express too much of it with all these people that were, that might have been able to step in. Yeah. Because I didn't want to ruin my chance of having someone be able to pay for a studio the next time. Right. And I remember CBS asked me to re record one of the songs for the CSI version, and I said, yes, I should have said no, because I didn't like the next version as much, yeah. but the opportunity, in my band, we were like, hey, do we want to go re-record this again? Yeah. Sure we want to go in the studio and make new music. Right. The artistic part of me was, was it. What were their instructions in the re-recording? Um, like, do it more. Make it more bad. of a ballad. More of a ballad. Yeah, it was more of a mid-tempo thing. Yeah. More of a mental pop thing, yeah. and then it needs to be more of a ballad featuring just my vocal, my vocal on top, heavier, uh -huh. less band throughout. And then right. I started to notice these things where, oh yeah, my picture's out there a lot more now. Yeah, they wanted my voice higher and louder, louder in the mix, and yeah. I was fighting that. So then these fights start to happen. With CBS, who I had an amazing relationship with, mm -hmm. and uh, another thing that I learned, I got really close with the president, this guy named Larry Jenkins, who also at the okay. time managed T Bone Burnett. Um, and still, still my friend to this day. I haven't not done my YouTube research to watch that scene in CSI. Don't so do it. You're just playing in a club. Playing in a club. Yeah. As myself in a yeah. fictional show. And the guy who didn't want to be. Anybody say like, who's this playing? Is this Will Daly? Or? Nope. No. It's like um, there's the 90210 classic thing. It was like the Flaming Lips, ladies and gentlemen. I never got that one. Yeah. We were close. Yeah. Not the 90210. Something else at that time that was doing that. Yeah. Um, Gilmore Girls maybe. Or, okay. But. Uh, no, I was in a bar at the end of the show, and Gary Sinise was in my band. He was in your band? So he played bass in the song. Oh, that's funny. He didn't on the, so, in the studio, did he? No. That would be amazing. Um, it was a really fun experience. Did he know how to play at all? Oh, he's really good. And he's really particular about, so on the recording, yeah. he's sliding here, so I want to yeah. make sure we have continuity of me sliding. Yeah. 
No, he's a good bass player, and he, oh, awesome. he tours around, um, does a lot of USO stuff. And oh, I didn't know that. That's great. So I'm in a fictional show playing myself, uh -huh. and uh, it was just weird. And then, then we have to be on the road. I'm touring that show. We do a couple of morning shows, and then I like wanted to like stop playing the song immediately. I was just creating havoc in my own career. I don't know why. I mean, it was the anxiety. It was fear of success, maybe. It was fear of... Um, and I always hated that, like, you know, John Mayer is really popular, and I, I didn't know his songs other than anything about him other than, like, but I knew who he was. Mm -hmm. And I knew about him and his life and his personality and who he was dating. His, his reputation preceded his music, and I didn't like any of that. But then um, I put out a record called Torrent, uh, which is a series of EPs. It was executive produced by T-Bone Burnett. We had Elliot Easton from The Cars. We had Roger McGuinn from The Birds on it and all these cool things. And that was really when I just like wrote a bunch of different songs that I had and it didn't have any continuity. So we released them in this large batch and it came out to be like 13 or 14 in the end. And to listen to it now is really disjointed, but it's kind of like a smorgasbord of, of my songwriting in all the places that it, it was at that time. And CBS put those out? CBS put those okay, out. They I stayed with know. me. I mean, we weren't selling a ton of records, but they re-signed me. Yeah. So it was a really soulful relationship and yep. um, went to bat for me a lot. And uh, But again, I was like, man, I'm not nailing my sound. And I felt like I hadn't nailed it since Goodbye or Bullet in that first indie release of Back Flipping Forward. Right. And I, with Torn, I kind of showed off a lot. Yeah. I mean, uh, the songs individually had vision. And in, in the intent was always to have that kind of wide thing. And Mar released it in three different clumps. I remember it got mastered by this special T-Bone thing that he only did 10 records of. And it was like me, Mellencamp, Dylan, a couple other people. And I was like the only unknown person. Oh, cool. And then T-Bone put me in a, a musical that Mellencamp and... Uh, Stephen King wrote, and at that time I played my first farm aid and Mellencamp's manager picked me up. Yeah. So then I had a guy who'd been in it for a long time since the 80s, and but he has no vocabulary for the way that things are going yeah. and changing and yeah. developing. And that soon became apparent. But he, I was with him for three years and he taught me a lot and uh, now, in playing Farm Aid, that's not nothing either. I mean, no, that was, those, that's no, probably I mean, your biggest audiences ever, right? I mean, no, things... Incredible things are happening. Yeah. I mean, I recorded with Cheryl Crow and Roseanne Cash and T-Bone Burnett right. and Jacob Dylan for a week. That was the musical that Mellencamp, oh, and I was like the coup in there of like, right. I remember being in the green room with Cheryl Crow and just thinking, I hope she doesn't think I'm the runner and asked to get me co get, get her coffee. Because <laughs> I remember when I, I, I met a lot of people at different times, I wasn't introduced to her. Yeah. And I was young. Yeah. It looked like the studio runner. Yeah. And she, this is a pivotal thing for me in both my studio development and just uh, confidence. I'd say, I'm going to jump on this because I don't want to say, who are you or anything? to go, I'm going to make some tea. Would you like some? And she said, yes, I'm making her tea. Yeah. And she says, we're, we're, we're recording the songs of the musical. So when you go out to see the musical, you buy it. Yeah. And all these people are on it. And she says, so your part is this. So she knew who I was. Oh, good. What my role was, yada, yada. And she was playing, maybe it was like my sister or my girlfriend or something. Uh -huh. That was the part she was singing. And so then we just got to chatting, and she was just the nicest person in the world. And I got to see her do, like, her vocal takes. And her first three vocal takes were rough, not grooving. And, you know, by the third take, she starts warming up, and fourth and fifth, she's got it. It's like, oh, yeah, we're all just figuring it out, and everyone's got to warm up. Everyone's got to get into it, you know? Right. Just watching being a fly on the wall for all of that, that whole session was so helpful. Right. It's like the magic is not undiluted magic. It's no. patience. It's no. perseverance. It's... I mean, you ever listen to, like, the Zeppelin tapes of the rehearsals where... Plants singing gibberish over stairway yeah, to heaven. Yeah. I think success allows you some of those free passes. Yeah. Because the narrative precedes the experience. Right, right. So the one thing about being as indie as I've remained, and some of my friends who have remained as indie as I am, we don't get a lot of free passes. Yeah. I was learning so much and I was getting stronger and better and more fans and 
all this while the, you know, the house is on fire. Mm -hmm. You know, I had a bathtub right. full of water. <laughs> so <laughs> that's a good way of putting it. Like the house is going to be ruined. You'll be safe, but yeah, you can't live in that house anymore. Right, but when I get it, I can be able to figure it out and have some information or whatever it is. A worst case scenario for me was always pretty awesome because I also had nothing to lose. I'd never like gotten huge and had to maintain. One thing, no one was really ever making a ton of money off me. Right. So I never got into that world where I was then responsible for people making money off right. me. And then those people start pushing you and keeping you designed. I don't mean that right. as nefar nefarious you, you as it sounds. You don't have a road crew that is going to go hungry if you take a few months off. <laughs> right, or a manager who needs that fifty to $300,000 a year from me right. and has built his life on that or her life on that. So I'm still free Yeah. to try things and, like, mess around. And I don't have a huge audience that is going to freak out, you know, Right. if I do somewhere. So I, I did it, and I had a more democratic process with my band. We were called Will Daly and the Rivals because I, again, wanted to, like, be like, this guy's more than just, like, singer-songwriter. And we would get out there and rock, you know? So we made a record, and when we had a blast making it, we get to mixing, fighting with the label about the mixing because the mixing got too pristine for the record that we thought was a little more, you know, some of the pop songs were like, these are more like Talking Heads pop songs, but right. then it got too poppy on the mix, you know? And um, it just, I, I still don't like the direction of the mixes. I thought it should have been a little more raw, a little more uh, rocking, but uh, I turn the record in, CBS flips out, they're super happy. Um, two people there working in the studio is like, 10 years ago, we just plug in the system, you got five singles and you just gotta hold on. But, you know, they kind of whisper behind doors to me that CBS Records isn't lasting that much longer. Again, so that's, I'm like, that's just, this didn't even phase me. Yeah. Because the day I started working in the industry, it was never lasting. Right. He says, do you mind if I hand this to some friends in the industry? Uh, I said, sure, because everything in my career has just been organic. Me pursuing the ability to make, write, and record music no matter what. The first person he sent it to was head of A&R at Universal. Guy loves it. We showcase Universal. We're signed to Universal. I get to Universal Records, and I'm like, man. I, then I'm like, I really can't believe it because... It just all feels so organic, everything. Mm -hmm. I, never, I had to hire lawyers to do deals. I never shopped. And to this day, I feel good. I feel it's all that stuff feels good because there's a legitimacy to making something and things organically happening. And, you know, we dug the record. It sounded good. We started playing the songs live, did a tour, played Farm Aid for the third time. And it was slated to be released by Universal. The day it was supposed to be released, I wake up, text messages... Look at iTunes. It's not on iTunes. Yeah. We were going to be on the front page. Yeah. It's not there. And nobody's Universal's, told you? Universal screwed up. Okay. Uh, they apologize. Okay. Th I sat in two marketing meetings because at CBS, that's what I did. Yeah. Because I was always learning, protecting, and also saying my ideas, like my idea of Torrent to do multiple releases because I just had a bunch of songs I wanted to do. And... Uh, I remember just being at Universal and just all these red flags. From like from experiences of 10, 15, I don't even know how long at that point, it's 2011, uh, almost 12 years of doing this, there's red flags left and right. I remember the head of Universal, I'm sure he's a great guy and I wish them all well. And it's the first time I ever met with him in the A&R office, it was just he, the, the A&R guy, my manager, and myself. And he walks in, he says, I just want to get one thing straight. I don't want you coming in here asking what's up with your Twitter and why you don't have more followers or why you're not trending. And I immediately just pitied him. Because your job to walk into the artist and have a meeting with him for the first time is to say that. And then for me, it was just like, this is a huge mistake. And I remember sitting in a marketing meeting, the discussion of 20 people in the room talking about what's single and the look on everyone else's face who's afraid to say anything between the three people who are talking about their ideas. Uh, I'm just like, I do not belong here. I need to get the hell out. I got super depressed. Because for the first time, I felt like, not like anxiety, like the CSI thing or anything like that. It was more, I am in a dead end here. Mm -hmm. Huge dead end, meaning I won't even be able to record music. 
right or like have a creative vision or try something new so i um i i, I play ball for a little while in in the most comically tragic ways you know they hook me up with this producer who's god awful and, and by that i mean he and i together are god awful yeah it might be great for someone else right um they wanted me to do a cover like what if we start you know re- reboot this with a cover and so i said me and this other cool a and r guy said how about the replacements and the, that guy says no 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 replacements aren't no one cares about the replacements he needs to do joe jackson is she really going out with him and I love Joe Jackson, but I had I had no way in on Joe Jackson is surely going out with him. Plus, the Rock on Tours already did that song that sounds like that. Doom, right. goom, goom. Yeah. So, I just called up my manager, who's still Mellencamp's manager. So I had John Mellencamp in my corner. I had the old reps at CBS who are still keeping an eye on this because they let something they cared about go. And I kind of had T Bone Burnett in my corner because I was on his musical and it was coming out soon. And, and I said I was on a five record deal. I would have yeah. paid one hundred fifty thousand dollars if they greenlit the second record. I was pretty sure they'd keep me spinning my wheels for two years and never yeah. greenlight that though. And I said, if you let me go, no hard feelings. I want to go be independent. And this this slot that I'm in belongs to someone who wants to be in this slot. Mm-hmm. Like it's gonna compromise all over the place, pretty much. Yeah, or come in with things that you already want. whatever it is. Right. They'll they'll know how to thrive in the system. Yeah. And even. Everything I'm just saying, I'm not saying they're evil or mm. bad. That's just not how I function. Had I said no to making that record, maybe I wouldn't have made a record that got to Universal, Which because then what happened is, so goodbye Red Bullet. Goodbye Red Bullet. Guy sells car to make record. I get radio, press, all this stuff. The narrative of that prompts someone to put it on. Right. And the narrative precedes it to allow you to, like, inquire like well let me stop and listen back flipping forward guy gets appendicitis thinks about Colin quits all of a sudden makes this record and is now everywhere narrative torrent guy releases a bunch of songs separately with all these guests on it decides not you know ditches the regular album route narrative will daily and the rivals comes out it's a picture of will daily on the record there's nothing there's no story behind it yeah. will daily leaves universal on his own choice makes a record on his own with help of fans press for days were any of those songs from national throat liberated from the will daily and the rivals or no but they were songs that i I, when universal was asking me to turn in new material i just wasn't sending yeah right and one of them that i did record with the producer that i didn't like and you know had to that's what's really frustrating me because now i have full awareness in the studio, I've made so much, so many different kinds of records and songs, and expressed myself in so many different ways. I know acutely now how I want to um, express myself. So you do the crowdfunding for National Throat, and that goes great. And it goes great, yeah. Went better than we expected. And then you toured that for a long time. Yeah, a long yeah. time. And then now here we are, a few years later, and you're doing this crowdfunding, and. Um, I guess at this point it's what 20 days away 20 yeah 20 you know 26 or something like that yeah um i mean yeah good uh national throat was i mean or at least on my own we charted on billboard had more success than anything prior yeah and got me all you know played in other countries for the first time and it was just it was great we won all won a lot of awards whatever that means mm-hmm. and uh have the you whole... had a, a title for the new one? I do. Are you not sharing? I'm not sharing no. <laughs> okay. I kind of, you know, there's a lot of. So the whole time I was like, oh my god, I can be solvent. Yeah. And do whatever I want, and you know, ever since National Throat, we've had discussions with a bunch of labels. Yeah. You know, it's like, uh, and I, I'm always to have the talk, but what's the point if you can raise all the capital? Right. But the whole time, that record, I started that record process. Oh, so just um, grow my fan base, grow my ability to connect directly to a fan, directly to the customer, and not let anybody come in between us. And it does well. But then in the three years while I'm promoting that record, the whole thing's still changing. Yeah. And I'm out there, and I, I'm aware of all the changes, but physical products being bought less and less. And then I launched this next record in a time when the country's going through a lot of turmoil yeah. and anxiety. 
and worry and anger and individual we're we're focusing on propping up things that we care about Mm -hmm. no matter what you care about everyone's focusing on like keeping the structure strong of things that they value and obviously art is more more, so important right now at these times but it's also built on disposable quote-unquote disposable income so uh we're in a different time of that too and what's happened is a a lot of where maybe three years ago people felt a lot of power, I think, in helping art for a good three or four or five years. And that exciting ability to do that and be the reason it exists. Brands then all of a sudden figured out, well, we can be the reason it exists. And they're jumping in right. like crazy now. I'm not saying that's good or bad. I'm just saying that that's what's happening. Yeah. And that's been helpful for me, too. I work with a ton of brands. Yeah. And if I didn't, I'd probably, you know, be panicking. Yeah. Do brands ever contribute to crowdfunding initiatives like would new balance ever write you a check uh, new balance gave me uh so one of the things that were uh we have this one package like you get everything that yeah. we have so for 800 bucks you get like 1400 dollars worth of stuff yeah. including two people get it uh custom sneakers that i'll design for you oh cool from new balance I just picture you like in a lab coat with protective glasses <laughs> like, <laughs> you know level <laughs> and it's weird man because I, I mean it's a lot of work doing it right now. It's it's a partic- peculiar time to be doing this. Um, and maybe it might have been easier for the narrative conversation to have had the record done. Mm-hmm. But I always like, man, if all my favorite bands said, hey, I'm starting the record today, yeah, I'd be banging down that door to be involved in, right. on day one. I'd order my 40, you know, a lot of these bands come out with pre-orders, you know, for $40 pre-order vinyl. Father John Misty just did a forty dollar pre order vinyl and I didn't get it. Yeah. It's, if he had done it before it was made, I would have bought it immediately. Yeah. Because I'd want to kind of follow along on just a glimpse of the magic. Right. Well I guess process. I mean it, it does seem like in this current climate, everybody is aware of everything that's going on mm-hmm. and you're aware on a day to day basis of how much funds you're raising. And yeah. that is probably translating into your mood of when you go into the studio that day. Yeah. You know? Yeah. The more people out of day when a lot of people are doing it, you just feel great. Yeah. And you're going to you know? be like, let's do that happy song. Yeah. <laughs> and it's weird. It's like if you post about uh, crowdfunding, if you send out an email, if you don't do anything, you probably won't get anyone. Right. You, you, you do some, some days. But if you post about it once, you get one person, at least one person. Yeah. So you know for every time you do something, you get one person. So, But you don't want to do something every second. Right. Um, but the one, maybe in retrospect, I'll say on this, the one that I'm in right now, and we're totally fine and killing it, and we have a lot of people doing it, and it's going great, I would think, just from feedback, no one knows what the hell I'm making. Right. And I, I want to keep that in my back pocket. It's part of the, the larger plan, too. Yeah. The, the, the people doing it, I'm realizing, wow, these people are doing it on faith, which is really, really cool. They just have faith that they're going to dig it or it'll be cool. Or um, So recently, we just updated the video with two of the songs, the music from two of the songs. Mm-hmm. The um, the recorded version? Yeah. Oh, cool. I haven't just, checked that like, out yet. Just like rough mixes. But So if you go to the video on the Pledge Music page right now, there's like two songs are featured yeah um and yeah i just want to i just want to hit 100 percent and then start the next chapter of telling the narrative because there's a big story behind it and there's a a full narrative um but i i also don't mind working a little harder because all i'm doing right now is endorsing the process of saying that we can be the reason music ex- music exists mm-hmm. And in doing so, we're more connected to that human experience of making music. And it feels different when you hear it, when you get it. And it's, I think it's a more empowering thing than having one guy in an office with a tie on that doesn't know how to make the music. Decide that you're going to hear it. Decide that it's going to get up on, loaded online right. or in a, on a vinyl. And I'd hate for us to skip the opportunity if we're so connected right now let's connect on building things not just on liking things Mm -hmm. or commenting on things Let's, let's build something there you have it listeners let's build something 
And you can help Will Daily build something by visiting www.pledgemusic.com slash projects slash will hyphen daily. Or if that's too tough to remember, just go to his site, willdaily.com. That's D-A-I-L-E-Y. And find the Pledge Music info on his front page. And if you want to investigate more great content from Berkeley Online, visit us at online.berkeley.edu slash take note. Thanks for listening. Talk to you soon.